Uh, good afternoon. My name is Keith Packard. I'm going to he here, be here talking to you about uh, some frame timing accuracy stuff I've been working on. I uh, kind of uh, uh, fell out of my work uh, on uh, VR headset stuff for Valve. Uh, this is kind of a, a follow-on to that. Uh, and uh, let's get started. Okay, now it's not working. Oh, push the wrong button. Introduction, what do we want? Uh, so uh, just, like, just like we've been talking about for a long, long time, what we want is every frame to be displayed with exactly the right contents at exactly the right time. How hard is this, right? Um, we want the, the frame rate to be fast enough. Obviously, if you make the frame rate one frame per second, uh, it's pretty easy to get exactly what you want uh, once a second. Uh, but if you're trying to actually do smooth animation or, more importantly, uh, VR or AR stuff, uh, you really need a higher frame rate than that. A uh, typical VR headset these days is 90 or 120 frames per second. Um, why is this hard? There's a lot of moving parts in this. You have applications that are doing complicated rendering. Uh, you have compositing environments. So that's the, uh, the presentation of the application to the user. Um, and in, uh, mo in a lot of mobile environments, we have power and thermal management issues. Uh, so that actually turns out to be a real challenge. Um, it's been interesting. I've been working uh, within the Kronos uh, uh, Vulkan SI group uh, and talking to my uh, colleagues uh, working on Android um, and Windows environments, and Android in particular. Uh, it turns out that one of the limitations you have on your phone is you don't want to scorch the user's hand. Uh, so when the, when the phone starts getting hot, you really don't have any choice uh, but to uh, slow, slow things down. Um, and so all of a sudden, uh, the, the system says, yeah, you, you have a lot less GPU and a lot less frame rate. Uh, deal with it. Uh, and that's, that actually turns out to be a challenge. Um, we also now, in, in the modern world, uh, all of our GPUs are very asynchronous. They have long uh, request queues. They can queue up you know, minutes of uh, rendering time. Um, and the, the, the display constantly has to wait for the GPU to be completed. You can't put anything onto the, onto the frame, onto the uh, screen um, until the entire frame has been rendered. And so you have this long latency between when I want to display things and when they actually appear on the screen. Uh, in order to get the GPU to really be fully occupied all the time, you don't want to have any pauses uh, waiting, uh, pauses between a GPU activity. Um, and how do we how do we usually manage that? Well, we just you know we have longer latencies, uh, so sometimes we'll have a couple of frames of latency between the application uh, generating information and it being presented to the user. Um, and when you have a head-mounted display and the head is moving around rapidly, the, that means that you have uh, you have to predict uh, uh, you know 30 or 40 milliseconds in the future uh, where the user is going to be looking in order to generate in order to compute the right pose and generate the right content for that scene. So there's a long latency between uh, when, we're, when we're generating things um, and when they're presented to the user. And the system environment uh, that happen, that's going to happen in you know, uh, 20 or 30 milliseconds in the future can be significantly different than the system configuration and environment uh, right now when the rendering is happening. Uh, so, uh, so there's a couple of things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the first thing is a, a pretty simple new extension we're working on within the SI uh, that's trying to rate limit applications. Um, if, if you've ever programmed in GL or Vulkan, um, the, the way that an application generates frames is it asks for a new rendering context or new, a new, a new um, uh, uh, image uh, buffer from the rendering system. It draws to that and then it hands in image, uh, that image back to the rendering system and says, please put the, this on the screen. Um, there's no, the, the, the only rate limiting in that system is how many buffers you have. Um, so the, the, uh, when the application requests an image, it's going to wait for one of the, if you have uh, quad buffering or triple buffering, it's going to wait for the last image uh, that is current being, currently being displayed to be undisplayed um, and then hand that back to you and then, and then you can draw to that and put it in the queue of images to be displayed. Um, the system can actually change the number of buffers that are going to be, uh, that are queued for display kind of dynamically. Um, if you're going from direct display uh, to a, a copying operation, if you have a, a compositing manager in the way, there might be additional buffering going on. And so you don't really have any way of knowing through the Vulkan API how many buffers there are in the system. Uh, when you create your rendering context in Vulkan, you kind of ask, can I get at least three? Um, and sometimes it may give you three, sometimes it could give you four or five. Uh, so you really don't have any way of knowing the latency between uh, when you're rendering and when it's going to be presented on the screen. You don't have any way of knowing of kind of internally rate limiting your application. So what we want to do is we want to we want to let the application have a little more awareness of uh, the actual presentation process and be able to actually uh, do its own rate limiting. Um, 
Uh, right now in GL, there's really no API at all. Um, um, uh, oh, so in uh, in Vulkan, I wanted to talk about this a bit. Right now, there is in Vulkan when you're doing uh, direct to display uh, rendering, uh, there's actually an event you can get that tells you when vblank occurs. Um, and we actually use that within the Valve VR system to try to do this rate limiting that we want to do. We're waiting for a vblank event, and then we generate another scene, um, and then we wait for a vblank event and generate another scene. And so we're actually kind of rate limiting based on vblank. What's the problem with just waiting for vblank? Uh, you have no idea if that vblank event corresponds to any particular frame being put up on the screen. Um, if your frame was a little bit late, you'll find out in a while that, oh yeah, that vblank you got, that wasn't actually correlated with the frame you thought it was. Um, so you have no, no direct correlation between the vblank event and the presentation. Um, and and, it, and the, this particular API in Vulkan uh, uh, uses a, the fence mechanism, which is heavily used within the, the rendering system. It said, oh, here's a way to block within the Vulkan API. We can wait for a fence. I know we'll use a fence for this display event. Um, and it turns out that the display system in many systems, uh, especially mobile systems, is very disconnected from the rendering system. Sometimes the silicon comes from a different vendor. And so trying to stir these two mechanisms, uh, waiting for display events and waiting for rendering uh, events to happen, into the same API within the implementation, it's like, well, the implementation just has to pull for the display events or pull for the rendering events. Um, until something happens. So it turns out that using the, this common uh, mechanism within Vulkan, as nice as it would be to have only one waiting mechanism, uh, was very, very difficult for the implementation. Um, and if you look inside the Vulkan implementation in Mesa right now, uh, you'll discover that both Radeon and Intel actually have a polling loop down at the bottom that if you ask for the wrong uh, waiting mode, it'll actually sit there in the driver spinning, uh, checking to see if either has been completed. It's kind of a mess. So we wanted to be a little simpler than that. So what we really want to do is, we, I don't want to wait for vblank, I want to wait for that scene that I actually asked to be uh, presented to actually appear on the screen. Right? That's kind of what I want to do. Then I can actually rate limit. I can say, oh, I have three more queued, that one just got shown, I'll go up and I'll get ready to present another one. So we really want to wait for the presentation to occur. So I want to wait for the vblank that happens at a specific presentation. Um, and instead of making it fence-based, we just did a really simple API that just blocks the thread waiting for the vblank to, uh, waiting for that presentation to, uh, uh, to occur. So you, you, uh, you call this function and it just blocks waiting for your presentation to occur. It doesn't use any fences and that way we're not conflating the, uh, the, uh, the presentation and rendering system waiting mechanisms with the, the rendering waiting mechanism systems. Um, and we, and you, uh, the application generates a little, a little number. If, you, if you've ever looked at the Google display timing extension, the application provides a, a number into that system as well that lets you uh, kind of identify which, uh, which presentations you're, you're talking about. And so we use a similar number here. It's pretty simple. Okay, so the next, uh, pre, uh, the next part is, uh, so now that I can actually wait for a presentation to happen, I want to get some feedback for when presentations happen, what times they are happening at, and I want to also be able to wait uh, to uh, ask for a presentation to be to happen at a specific time. All right, so we're going to have this. We're going to actually generate a, a closed loop feedback system where I can wait for presentations to happen. I can find out when they happen with very precise timestamps, and I can ask for a presentation to happen at a particular time. And this is kind of novel in Vulkan. I don't know if it happens in the Windows world, but in GL there wasn't any feedback. Right, if you've ever used the GL mechanisms to uh, present it to specific times, all that you can ask for in GL is please, 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 please present this. You know, pr uh, you can you can say please present my my frames every other V blank or every V blank, or go as fast as you can. Uh, with some of the with the OML sync control extension, you can actually ask for presentations to happen at a specific time, but you never get to find out if it actually worked. All you get to do is ask. Uh, you can't find out. Uh, if you're getting behind, uh, you can't find out um, you know, how much lag you have between the end of rendering and the actual presentation, so you don't know how much buffer you have between those two operations. All you get to, add, all you get to do is, is plead. So what, what, what uh, Google did is they came up with an extension called Google Display Timing that provides both the ability to ask for uh, rendering to happen at a specific time and to get feedback from the system that will tell you when that display actually occurred. Um, an additional piece that, uh, that the Google, Google Display Timing extension provides is when, kind of how much lag there was between the end of rendering and the beginning of the presentation. And so you get some idea of how much slop you have in the system. 
uh, that time in the Google Display Timing extension wasn't very well defined. Um, and so we're trying to, trying to tighten up some of those specifications as we work through a, a, formal, a formal, uh, formal SI spec. Okay. So we want to get display, uh, frames displayed on time and tell the application when, the, when that timing happened. Uh, as, I, as I talked about in OpenGL, we have, a, we have some existing extensions in OpenGL that we could kind of go back and look at and try to figure out how they worked. Um, if, if, I don't know if any of, it, any of you have ever tried to use OML sync control. I tried to implement it uh, in, in Mesa. It was kind of an adventure. Um, the, uh, the, the present timings in the X present extension tries to adopt some of the language used in OML sync control, which is probably not a great idea. Uh, but it, it, does, it, it does provide some level of presentation control. Um, it actually is, uh, it has a, a, a suffers from the same bug that the Google Display Timing uh, extension in, uh, pr uh, proposed by Google has. Um, when you ask for a frame to be presented, the time that you present that you give to the extension is the time before which the frame may not be presented. Right, so you give it a time before which the frame cannot be presented. So if you give it the time that you think the frame is actually going to be presented at, and you're a nanosecond too late, then the system says, well, the frame is actually going to be displayed a, a nanosecond before the time you gave me. So I'll wait for an entire next frame, because uh, the extension says I have to display the frame after the time you gave me. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to make this work a little better uh, in, the, in, the, in the Vulkan SI. And we're kind of struggling because the hardware that we have, uh, in particular NVIDIA hardware, actually lets you put into the display queue, please display this at a particular frame. And uh, the, the NVIDIA hardware is this, has this not before semantics. It says, don't display this uh, until at least this frame. And so we're trying to figure out how we can give the user a more, a more uh, easier to use semantic where you say, where you, where you tell it the time that you actually wanted to be presented and the system will kind of pick the frame closest to that instead of the one after that. We're trying to uh, provide that semantic to the user while still providing the semantic uh, to the hardware of please don't display uh, before this particular time. And so that's, uh, that's one, of the, uh, one of the complicated things. Uh, GIA also had this old uh, swap control, which is the minimum number of frames per presentation. And that's actually an interesting semantic. And uh, we've talked to a bunch of application developers about what kind of thing, what kind of control they want um, in a Vulkan API. And this is kind of what they want. They want to be able to say, I need this frame to be displayed for at least one frame or at least two frames. Um, and if you, if you set your minimum frame timing for at least two frames, then you're kind of going at half rate. Um, and it's actually fairly predictable. Um, and it's a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, semantic for applications. It's like, if you want to be render, rendering at half frame rate, you set your minimum number of frames to be two frames. And then you may miss an occasional frame, um, but then every, you aren't going to get, uh, you aren't going to get the, uh, the compounded error. If you have a, a system where you're displaying it at absolute time every frame, uh, one of the problems is that, it, is that if you miss a frame, then one frame is going to be displayed for an extra amount of time, and then some subsequent frame uh, in the future is going to be displayed for less time than you desired. It may be dropped entirely. Uh, and that means you get two bumps in your animation. You get the bump when you miss the frame, and then you also get the bump when you recorrect. And, providing, and if you provide this minimum display timing, then the application can correct can discover that the frame was missed by using our feedback information and correct without getting an additional bump in the animation. So we kind of want this combination of please display at absolute times, we think, but oh, uh, maybe instead what we want is display at least this many frames. Uh, and so there's this uh, complicated trying to figure out how to balance these two needs that we're working on within the SI community right now. Okay. So the current Vulkan APIs has this Google Display Timing thing that we talked about. You can go read about that. That's actually a, a published uh, specification you can read about on the, on the interwebs, uh, where you specify an absolute time relative to clock monotonic. Um, and that gives you a nice, everybody uses the same time thing. Um, it has problems that the GPU clocks and the system clocks may not all be synchronized. They may be running off different crystals. They may, they may uh, slew relative to one another. 
Um, it gives you some feedback about when uh, frames were presented. It has this very strange value that tries to give you some idea of how much slop you have in the rendering time. So it'll, it'll tell you that uh, it'll t it, it has a value. I'm not quite sure what the semantics are because they're kind of vague. But it says uh, you have like two milliseconds of spare time in the frame. So your frame was ready two milliseconds before it was needed. So it's like, oh, I could do a little more rendering, make my scene a little more complicated. Or you could see that number decrease uh, you know, towards zero, and your application could say, oh, wait a minute. The scene is getting too complicated. I need to do something to compensate for that, either reduce my frame rate or reduce the scene complexity if you can do that. Uh, and try to predict when the system is about to go to uh, about to drop a frame and try to mi uh, try to avoid losing frames entirely. Uh, that's what that's for. Um, I'm pretty sure that we don't need that in the display timing stuff because I'm pretty sure we can actually get that using the existing timestamp stuff uh, out of the GPU. You can just ask the GPU when the uh, when the timing fixed uh, when the when the GPU rendering was done. Uh, because we uh, we do have another extension called EXT calibrated timestamps. And what EXT calibrated timestamps lets you do is it lets you get, uh, it lets you query a bunch of clocks in the system and say, okay, what's the current GPU time and the current uh, wall clock time? Uh, give me times in both of those domains. And then you can use those values to uh, correlate your rendering times that are you're coming out of your GPU and your uh, display times that are coming back from your display feedback. So that's kind of a, a, a tiny little extension that's like, oh, wait, this solves uh, part of the problem that Google Display Timing was trying to do with this rendering latency, with this rendering um, gap, uh, and and do it in a kind of a more principled fashion. So that's kind of a, a, a nice a nice additional extension. I don't know when that one came came around. It seems like it's reasonably new, but it's actually pretty easy to implement. Okay. So what we're trying to do in the SI right now is to figure out how to uh, satisfy the various needs that we've gotten from. Uh, both implementers and existing uh, hardware vendors and existing um, kind of the existing software stack. So we're trying to mix all those together. Google Display Timing had a lot of great ideas in it, but it missed some of these key notions of rounding to the nearest frame, kind of, um, and uh, also the ability to to display uh, uh, display uh, scenes for a particular number of frames. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do is figure out how to deal with variable rate displays. Um, variable rate displays are are on the desktop, what a variable rate display it means is that you can you can uh, display a uh, you can you can ask the system to to kind of dynamically change the refresh rate to kind of arbitrary values. You can say, oh, I want to display this uh, this particular frame for you know 14 milliseconds or 28 milliseconds, which would in theory let you kind of uh, dynamically adjust. Um, the frame rate in, in, in less discrete steps. So instead of going from 90 hertz to, six, to, uh, to 45 hertz or from uh, 60 hertz to, uh, to 30 hertz, you could go from 60 hertz to 50 hertz. And that seems kind of cool because then you could smoothly adjust your frame rate. Uh, in, in the mobile system, it doesn't mean the same thing. In mobile systems, what a, a variable refresh rate means is that the system is going to change the refresh rate at you uh, to manage thermal, to manage its thermal environment, to manage the battery, and it's going to tell you what your frame it is being changed to. Uh, and uh, the the question that we had uh, in the SI group was, um, can you give us some warning? Because uh, right now in an Android environment, it's just going to say, nope, your frame rate's changing, and uh, good luck with that. And so if you're running some kind of animated display, it's kind of an enforced uh, an enforced jitter in your application. You don't have any choice about it. You're just going to get your frame rate. Uh, knocked down. You'll find out about it after the fact, after you've rendered uh, the, the frame for the wrong time, um, and you're going to see uh, a glitch on the screen. And so we're trying to figure out if we can get some uh, perspective uh, information, like, can you tell us when the frame rate is going to change, you know, 30 milliseconds ahead of time? That'd be great. Um, the other interesting thing that uh, came up was because we now have these two different mechanisms talking about uh, frames, uh, presentations, uh, now, uh, and they each need to have kind of an ID of uh, a number, uh, uh, application assigned number for the presentation. Uh, we kind of split out the, uh, the application assigned number for a presentation to a separate extension. So it's one of those, we have these two, we could either glue everything into one giant extension, which is very unvulcan like or we can split, uh, we can do a little more granular separation. So you're going to see kind of three extensions come out of this. You'll see this presentation ID, where the application can assign a number to a presentation, and then it can use that number to either wait for it to finish, or use that number to get feedback of when it, of when it actually completed. So it's kind of a, kind of a nice, nice cleanup. Okay, uh, moving on to how we're fixing things in X, because I, I said I was going to be talking about all three of these. 
uh, X, uh, the kernel, and Vulkan, and Mesa. So in X, the presentation spec is actually not too bad. As I said, the uh, ideas in the X presentation spec came from uh, the, uh, the OML sync control extension in uh, OpenGL. So we already have this notion of presenting uh, a, a frame at a particular time. Uh, the present extension already gives us feedback about when presentations occurred, and they're actually fairly timely. Uh, the event delivery specification in the present extension is as soon as the present has completed, then you get an event delivered back to you. So you, it's within, you know, within a few milliseconds of the, of the top of frame. So we're actually able to generate the feedback information that we need in Vulkan without changing the present extension at all, which was kind of cool. Okay, so what's the problem with present then? Well, uh, the implementation doesn't exactly do what the specification says. Uh, given that I wrote both, it's kind of frustrating, but oops, sorry about that. Um, when, but only when the desktop is composited. So if you run a desktop uncomposited, like I do, because I like living in 1980, um, things work great. So I kind of never noticed this problem. Uh, but in a composited environment, um, uh, you get this, you get this uh, weird problem where you have a drawing, uh, the drawing operation, um, which then waits for the, uh, wait, waits for the uh, drawing to complete, and then the present extension sends a notification to the compositing manager, oh, by the way, there's a new frame, and it happened in the last frame, and the compositing manager waits, does its compositing, and then waits for the next frame, and then presents the scene that you, present, that you had finished and ready for the previous frame. So in, when you're compositing in an X desktop and using the present extension, you are guaranteed to get an additional frame of latency between when you asked for the frame to be displayed and when it was actually displayed. Um, does that seem like a bug? <laughs> it's like uh, applications could actually notionally cope with this by knowing that there was additional frame. Uh, but the, the problem is, is the extension gives you feedback about when the frame was presented and it doesn't tell you when the compositor presented your frame, it tells you when it told the compositor that your frame was ready to be presented. So yeah, terribly broken. So I've got some ideas on how to fix that. Uh, the, um, the, the question is, what do we do? Um, uh, so the, the, what I'm hoping to do uh, is, uh, is um, some work that I started and that Roman has been uh, kind of picking up is to, uh, is to add some semi-automatic compositing into the Windows system so that instead of having every frame go through the compositing manager, get, uh, get uh, blended into the, into the uh, final image and then put onto the screen by the compositing manager, when you have an application that's you know, unoccluded, it doesn't have anything complicated going on, it's not, it's not zooming around on the screen or wobbling or anything like that, you can just have the X server just do the compositing operation for that, for that window by itself. Uh, that way, the X server would actually be able to close the loop uh, a lot more tightly and be able to control the display timing uh, of that presentation. Uh, going through the compositing manager is really, really hard, not because we couldn't fix the X server part, but because the compositing manager has arbit kind of arbitrary complexity in it. And it's like, I just want to get that out of the way and get the events and uh, extra X requests and extra context switches and all that stuff out of the way and make X look a lot more like Wayland because uh, Wayland has the advantage of having the, the, the display system and the, uh, uh, and the compositor all tied together. So I, I kind of want to uh, tie those together. Um, my eventual goal is, uh, was kind of, is kind of being met by the community uh, presentation yesterday in the, in the little min, uh, mini con uh, across the hall yesterday afternoon. It uh, looks like other people were having the same idea where we want to put together a shared uh, DRM-based compositing infrastructure. Uh, right now, we have a lot of compositing managers. Right, we have uh, we have Weston, we have uh, Mutter, we have uh, Kwin. They're all doing essentially the same work. Um, and when you're doing a direct-to-display compositing manager, there's a lot of work that you would like to share, uh, especially in terms of being able to use overlays effectively. Uh, the uh, DRM API for using overlays, multiple planes, is really complicated. Um, there's a lot of corner cases, a lot of error cases, and uh, trying to get all of that right in all of these code bases is really, really hard. Um, and so trying to put all that code into one place would be fantastic. Um, and then, then we could actually use that same library and have X actually put windows in overlays, uh, which would be really cool. And that would actually get, um, 
kind of get uh, exactly what you want from your desktop where you have your foreground application that's animating uh, really fast, not having, to do addition, uh, not having to do an additional copy to get its content into a window. Uh, just put it into overlay plane, uh, just like Weston can do today uh, most of the time, uh, and have everything, have everything go really fast. And, and getting the same uh, kind of low latency uh, loop through the X server instead of going all the way out to Compositing Manager and back. So that's my goal, and it looks like other people are, are kind of on board with the same plan, so it's pretty cool to see. Okay, uh, so the, the final piece of kind of getting this stuff to work a little more responsibly is to try to, try to figure out how to fix the kernel. Uh, the kernel is really hard uh, to fix, and I'm not really quite sure how we're gonna do it. Uh, so this is more of a problem statement than a solution. Uh, the other pieces are pretty, pretty easy to understand, but trying to fix the kernel is always a pain. So the current API is really awkward, uh, when you want to do a flip, you're going to do an atomic mode set that presents uh, new frame buffers uh, for a particular set of planes. Uh, and that's all it's going to do. Within the kernel, there are special code paths that recognize this case. Oh, they're doing an atomic mode set, but they're not actually setting in mode. Okay, we can go through the special flip path, which is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, the way we did it before atomic mode settings, we actually had a separate I.O. control that just did page flipping, uh, which semantically made more sense to me uh, because that's all I was doing. I wasn't doing a mode set. I was changing what frame buffer was being presented in the current mode. But one of the advantages of going through the atomic mode set API is that in theory you, could, you might be able to change what format your, uh, your buffer was without, doing, without getting any glitches. Uh, and you can, of course, because it's the atomic API, you can change multiple planes simultaneously. So we get, use one API to do everything instead of having, instead of having to create a new multi-plane uh, uh, page, page flip API. Uh, the current API that we have, though, is kind of awkward. Uh, there's a finite event limit in the kernel. So if you actually try to queue too many, uh, too many event requests down to the kernel, so you try to queue too many flips or try to queue too many uh, queries for, the, uh, for when the flipping has happened or try to block too many times, uh, the kernel actually says, no, I'm sorry, my queue for events is full. Uh, this might have made sense in, I don't know, 1975 when you had a limited amount of memory in your kernel, but these event objects are not large. Uh, they're, you know, hundreds of bytes. You know, it'd be nice if I could have more than whatever the limit is. I think it's like 64 or maybe 100 or something. So I want to get rid of that. Because uh, that really that makes using the API very complicated. Because every time you call into the API, it might say no. I'm sorry, my queue for potential events that you might generate with that is full. Go pull some events out, process them, and then come back and ask me to queue that again. So the application actually has to go through this crazy little dance where it tries to do, tries to queue a flip event, and the kernel says nope. I'm sorry, your event queue is full. And so the application has to go then do v blank event processing synchronously before it can queue the event, uh, uh, queue the flip operation, which makes the, uh, which makes the API really, really uh, awkward. Um, I'd like to be able to um, uh, use times in nanoseconds instead of microseconds. We have high resolution clocks in the, in the kernel. Uh, having an API that uses microseconds in 2019 doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, I've done some of that already. Uh, there are some, uh, some, some new APIs in the kernel that use nanoseconds. I, I, we need, just need to finish the rest of them. Another problem in the kernel is there's only one queue slot available. So once you queue a flip, uh, you're full. You can't queue anymore. So you can't ask the kernel to, to queue up a bunch of frames to be displayed and have your application go to sleep for a while until they're all, until they're, until they're uh, space to be uh, space for more rendering to happen. The really hard part, though, is there's no way to say, oh, that one that I queued to you, yeah, don't display that. Display this one instead. Uh, so in, in Vulkan, uh, there's this uh, presentation mode called Mailbox. A mailbox says, please display. You can keep asking for uh, presentations to be displayed um, uh, in, until, until vBlank happens. And then at vBlank, it's supposed to pick the most recent one. Well, with the Linux API, we, we literally can't do that because once you've asked the kernel, to queue a presentation for the next V blank, that one is going to be presented. There's no way to say no, I don't want that presented. So we have this API in Vulkan that we literally can't implement with DRM today, and that's kind of a problem. Uh, the other thing is that, the, um, the, that doing the flip uh, often blocks waiting for rendering to complete. And so I call into the API to queue a flip, 
And when I call the API, the kernel actually blocks me in that API waiting for rendering to complete. Uh, so even before I get back out of the kernel, it's waiting for, waiting for the GPU to do a bunch of work. Uh, and that's kind of, a, the, that's kind of obnoxious. Uh, this happens uh, in other places in DRM. When I try to move the cursor, it often blocks waiting for rendering to complete to move my cursor. Uh, so there's a bunch of, a bunch of uh, stuff in the atomic mode setting API where it's unnecessarily waiting for the GPU. And it's just, I think we can fix those. I think they're just bugs. And as I said, we can't actually support mailbox mode. Uh, so I really want to be able to queue without blocking. I just want to be able to, uh, I don't want to have, I don't have to pull events out of the system. I don't want to have it wait for the, uh, wait for the GPU to finish rendering anything. Uh, I, I really want to move, uh, really want to have the system inside the kernel uh, queue that thing to the hardware after the, after the rendering is complete on its own. It's like, yeah, okay, I know that the rendering isn't done here. Just take this little ticket, and when the rendering is complete, you know when the rendering is complete, you're about to block waiting for it anyhow. Uh, then queue it to the hardware for presentation. Uh, and that way, you know, user space can keep going on, which is kind of important uh, when you have a, a compositing manager. Um, uh, the alternative is to have user space kind of take an event uh, when the rendering is complete and then wait to queue it until after rendering is complete. And that means you're taking another user space to kernel space transition just to, uh, just to avoid blocking. Uh, I really want to be able to queue multiple flips. Uh, I really want to be able to say, okay, I've gotten 47 frames completed. There are buffers sitting there. I want to be able to hand them to the kernel and have the kernel just take an interrupt and display the next frame. Uh, for movie players, uh, where you have an infinite amount of frames that you can compute, uh, this means that your user space can basically shut down and go to sleep uh, for as many frames as you want, uh, which saves a bunch of power uh, and also saves a bunch of, uh, a bunch of user, uh, user space interaction. It seems like a pretty simple place, uh, thing to do. Uh, and, then, and, uh, and I really need to be able to cancel the queued entries. Right now we have a queue depth of one. Uh, I really want to have a, a longer queue depth, uh, but even if we only get a queue depth of one, I really need to be able to say, you know, wait a minute, I don't want that thing that I asked you to display to be displayed. Please display this other thing instead. With current hardware, that's kind of complicated because current hardware, uh, typically the way that we actually queue a display is we actually queue a register write to the display in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the batch buffer to the GPU. So the GPU tells itself to display a particular frame after the rendering is complete. And that means that the GPU can do this thing all on its own, which is kind of cool. It's like you, you queue up a bunch of rendering, and then right after the rendering in, in the same command queue, you just stick a please flip to the, the thing I just rendered into the command queue. Uh, which is awesome for a, for, a, a, uh, for a performance perspective because you don't even have to wake up the CPU. The GPU kind of writes its own register to flip to the frame that it just finished drawing. Kind of cool. Uh, the problem with that is that there's no way to undo that operation because that's sitting in the command queue right now. I don't really know how to make this work right because uh, I really like the notion that the GPU is going to tell itself uh, to display that frame. Uh, but I really want to be able to say, oh, Mr. GPU, or whatever, um, please, that command that I queued to you, yeah, uh, pretend that I didn't do that, and do this other thing instead. So we need to figure out uh, how we can re-architect, uh, potentially re-architect the drivers to make that work uh, a, little more, a little more sensibly. Uh, let's see. Summary. Okay. So... We are working in the uh, Vulkan SI group uh, to extend the Vulkan API to provide, uh, to provide all the functionality that we need. Uh, I think that that work is going along really well. Um, I, I, I uh, actually owe the group uh, some, some updates to implementation and testing, but I think the, the specifications are well in hand. They'll eventually become standards, I hope. Um, so it, from the applications perspective, I think we have an API that's going to work. I'm really happy with the progress that we've made and uh, with my other compatriots in the SI group. It's been a great, uh, great experience. Uh, now we need to actually get that implemented in the Linux space, and that means fixing uh, the Windows systems. Um, I'm, I'm not very, uh, uh, I don't really work in the Wayland environment, but I think it's going to be fairly straightforward there. Um, ish, yeah. So the, the hope is that we're going to be able to get this shared, uh, shared presentation mechanism library that sits underneath all the compositors so that everybody can share the same implementation of the DRM piece of that and then, and then uh, Wayland and X and everybody else can sit on top of that. Um, 
I want to work on fixing the timing and the composited X stuff. Uh, Roman's been working busily um, at the um, at the semi-automatic compositing stuff, uh, which can, uh, which will eventually be able to take care of that, uh, take advantage of that shared library. Uh, so that work is going on. There are patches on the list that need some review. Um, I've been trying to get to them. Um, I've been kind of busy. Um, and then I want to go and try to fix the kernel uh, to actually make the flipping a little more reliable and let us actually implement uh, mailbox mode, which is a really important mode uh, for displaying stuff. And, and that will become more evident when our, the, the SI spec for the, uh, the display timing stuff comes out, uh, why, why that's even more important. Uh, and also I want to get to the, the notion of nanosecond resolution. Uh, because that way we can we can start doing some uh, uh, some timing oriented attacks on your GPU. I'm I'm pretty sure that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. No, please don't do that. <laughs> okay, and that's what I have for you today. Um, if there's uh, questions, I, well, we have a little bit of time for questions. Otherwise, I'll be around for the rest of the week and uh, hope to he see you here and online. Thanks very much. Yeah, so for, for the Wayland side, there's there's some fun interactions where when you have multiple surfaces uh, visible on screen at the same time and you want them to be updating it at different times, that's basically the, the thing we've got to got to figure out before we can do this on Wayland. Um, as for the KMS side, though, there is, it's called amend, a new flag to Atomic. Um, that's been kicked around on DRI Devel. Basically, the, the original sin in that was um, updating cursor uh, much faster than you update the rest of your content. Um, so the idea was that you would submit for one CRTC your content update, and that would happen at a time. And then there would be another thread which would come in and request the, the kernel amend the pending commit with some delta to say, move the cursor position. Um, but that seems like it could be something that would be useful for, like you were saying, that the unflip or unqueue or cancel, you could amend that back to, to previous content. Um, that is, it's on DRI Devel at the moment, um, but it's definitely not done. <laughs> well, and how does that, I'm concerned about, so a specification is a good start. Yep. How we can actually make that work in the hardware? It does work on some drivers. I can't remember which. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the difficult part of the spec, which was another corner case we, we hit when we were doing Wayland and uh, just didn't solve, we went on to do other things, was um, the, the signaling back to user space to let them know, you know, once you've, once you're queuing a bunch of stuff which may or may not happen in the future once you've got the ability to to amend your requests, <coughs> signaling back to the user which bits of those actually succeeded. Yep, uh, that that gets super complex. Well, and, and you need to you need to be able to signal whether the amend actually succeeded or whether it was too late. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, so so that's the that's the main bit that's left on amend UAPI. Okay. Cool. And then the hard work of actually making it work. Details. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I had a question about um, um, so <clears throat> one cool thing about this is that clients can reduce latency because they know when they get presented and then when they fi finish rendering, so they can know how much slope they have. Yep. So that works well uh, if they are directly scanned out on screen, but if, if there's composition in between, then the clients have like, uh, the, the, they cannot submit it too late because there's still composition going on. So do, do you have ideas to fix this and somehow to let the compositor say, uh, I'm gonna start compositing at this time, so please finish your rendering before this time? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the ambigu ambiguity that was in the Google Display Timing okay. extension, is they had this notion of, the amount, of uh, the amount of extra space you had in the rendering time, but where that ended was not well defined. Mm -hmm. um, and I would obviously really like to define that as when composition starts. Mm -hmm. um, 
It gets a lot easier when your application gets to use its own plane because there's no composition involved. Uh, and so my, my frank hope is that we'll get to the point where applications that are animating and want smooth animation always end up in a separate plane and we don't have this compositor lag. Um, and if you do have a compositor lag, uh, we need to provide some way to provide feedback about that to the application. Um, and I don't know how that might work. Uh, in the X environment, uh, the uh, compositing manager could, could uh, tell the X server, oh, I'm going to need this much time. I will be starting my presentation at this time in the frame. Um, and so when you report uh, information to, back to applications, tell applications about that, about when, the, when the, top of frame, the top of frame actually occurs so that they can adjust their, their rendering, um, the, the, how much so right in the Google display timing, it provided you this notion of how much slop there was in the rendering time. Okay. Uh, and we've, we've uh, and, and it looks like that's not, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Instead, what we're using is we're using the existing uh, timing mechanisms to get a time out of the GPU of when your rendering completed, and we're getting, uh, we're using the, the, the timing, uh, the calibrated timing stuff to convert that to a, to a system time, and now I can compare that to my display time. And so the application can compute its own slop. And so now all that we, all that we need to be able to do is present, is give to the application how much time, uh, how much time the compositor is going to take out of that. So when the compositor is going to start rendering in the yeah. scene, and so the application could then do its own computation. I'm not quite sure how to do that. Uh, and so that's kind of, at this point, it's going to be outside of the scope of the Vulkan API. Uh, the application is going to have to figure that out, that out on its own. I don't know how we're going to do that. But okay. I think all we need to do is, is give the application the, the amount of time that the compositor is going to take out of the frame to do its own work. And so essentially the application would be, could, would be able, in theory, uh, to subtract that from the, the, the slop that it saw when it did its own computation. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, we, so we have a protocol in Wayland to say when the frame was presented, yep. but it's also missing the information. Where does composition start if there's composition? Well, <laughs> if everything goes in a plane, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, it, and in a typical environment, you're not, you're, uh, the, user's, the user's attention is not looking at more than one application at a time. Mm. Um, and, and because of that, uh, making, making sure that foreground application, which has the user's focus, uh, making sure that application gets into an overlay plane means that application is going to get as much rendering time as possible. So that, that's really my goal of using overlays, is to make sure that the foreground application gets all the time that it needs. So maybe we can get there. <laughs> that, th that seems like an easy place to get to. Uh, the more complicated place of actually making all the applications aware of the compositor, uh, the compositor uh, chunk of time, that, that seems actually harder to me. So getting to using planes seems like an actually a simpler problem to solve and more useful. So we'll solve that problem first, and then we can go on to trying to actually make uh, fully composited systems uh, a little bit better as well. OK. Cool. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I think we have, what happens next, Jake? Another presentation. Awesome, thank you very much. <laughs>